Okay, this video is from a motorcycle enthusiast's perspective or a biker's perspective or whatever the hell anybody wants to class me as because I don't really care. It doesn't make any difference. It has no bearing on me going about my business day to day anyway, so feel free. But it's my opinion on a motorcycle, lifestyle, whatever you want to call it, you know what I mean? Related topic. So if you're if the only thing you care about is lifting weights and shit, then you might not want to watch this video and that doesn't hurt my feelings a bit. Uh channel's called entitled James Tiny Vest. So it's pretty much I have free license to discuss whatever are my interests. And this is a large, you know, I actually been riding motorcycles for longer than I've been lifting weights. That's for sure. And I've been lifting weights for 30 years. Anyway. So, are you a biker or a rub? And what rub stands for is rich urban biker. And then you have these other subcategories and these other categories, I guess, like wannabes or posers or... I don't know. It's not my... It's not my thing, you know? It's not my, uh... You know, it's not my jurisdiction there. I don't really make the rules and I don't, uh... follow rules that other, other men make for themselves and amongst their own. I, I do what... Suits me what I agree with. So, if I get some of this nomenclature wrong, you know, too bad. If that's what you think. Anyway. Uh, so, the rich urban biker phenomenon thing. Yeah, I do recognize that it is a thing. Has been a thing. Uh, past participle. In the motorcycle world or the biker hardcore or biker lifestyle world and yeah it was at first it was a huge change it was a huge change because uh, I'm talking about the influx of people putting on leathers putting on nice crisp shiny brand new gear that they just bought from the dealer certified sanctified you know licensed stuff and going out on a weekend and then Monday morning they're wearing a suit and a tie or or whatever have you sitting behind a desk somewhere and they're accountants or they're doctors or they're lawyers other kinds of business people or they're just family people that are uh, they don't they don't live Harley Davidson you know 24 7 and there was a huge influx of these types of people now at first you know when I first started riding Almost everybody that rode a Harley Davidson, almost everybody that you saw on a Harley Davidson was what you would picture as a biker, a, a biker, you know, um, with the dirt and everything that goes along with it. And that's because these bikes leaked oil. They almost all leaked oil. You could build one fresh and not leak a damn thing, but it still was, had a tendency, shovel head motors had a tendency to leak, pan head motors had a tendency to leak. Their engines I'm familiar with. But uh, when I first started riding, that's what I saw riding bikes. I saw bikers riding bikes, and I was attracted to it because it looked like they just didn't give a didn't give a flying f. I watch my language for some of the people that are fans. They didn't give a flying f about uh, what other people thought, you know, or they didn't feel the need to comply to social norms. And being coming from a background where I was bullied as a kid. You know, I had leg braces at one point when I was really young. And, um, you know, outcast. Wasn't the coolest guy in school, that's for sure. You know, later on, things began to change, but that's because the avenues I pursued that opened up these other possibilities and opportunities and, and things for me, you know, that I changed. Um, But I was attracted to the, the Harley Davidson crowd, the biker biker crowd, because uh, they looked like social outcasts by their own choosing, that they just had 
were separatists. And uh, I remember very dramatically one time as a kid, I was in the back seat, my dad's Buick. My dad and mom were in the front seat, my brother and I were in the back. And we were going through a little part of Baltimore County, a uh, suburban, now it's very city like, but it was kind of a suburbanish part, but it was a little busier. There were like some, there were stores, there were no malls yet, there were no malls, but not our, around where we were. But there were like little, were there shopping centers? I think there kind of probably were small shopping centers. There were, there were shopping centers, but not really like today. Um, so we were in that area. We lived in a more, still suburban, but a more isolated area than that. So we were in that area. And it was nighttime, probably a Friday night or something. And we were at a red light and the light turned green. And like uh, two cars up was a guy on a rigid frame chopper. And I was probably single digit years. You know, maybe I was nine. I might have been 10, but I, I, I'm not so sure. Maybe I was seven, but I remember it very clearly and vividly. And his bike had stalled for whatever reason, quit running. And he, though he was holding up traffic, he got off that bike with no sense of urgency, took his sweet time, put it on a kickstand, spun out the kicker pedal, and began to you know, go through the ritual of kickstarting his bike and getting it back on again and then climbed on it, taking his sweet ass time and went on about his own business. He didn't feel the pressure or intimidation or uh, anything that, 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 you know, he wasn't nervous or self-conscious that he was holding somebody up or any other thing. He just, you know, was oblivious in his own world. And I'm not, he wasn't rude. Right, he wasn't, didn't go out of his way, he wasn't offensive. He was just doing his thing, living his life. Bike stalled, it was part of his life. Got off the bike, got it started, went on about his business with no, no detectable sense of any urgency. And that kind of left an impression to me like, wow, that guy just straight up doesn't, and I didn't know in these terms, that guy doesn't give a fuck. I didn't know that in that term at that age most likely, but that's kind of how it felt. It was like, wow, that guy's really his own, own guy. And it's not like the only display of, of men that I felt like were their own man, but I could relate to that. That was closer to me than like looking at my dad. My dad was, you know, my father was, he was the hardest working man I ever knew to this day. You know, I, I, I'm not half of what he, he was, not half the man he was. He was an incredible guy. And, uh, you know, that was like a really high bar there. Um, but this guy, I could kind of relate to that. Like, I wish I had that kind of confidence. I wish I had that individuality. I wish I had that security in who I was that I could, you know, move through the world unencumbered by anybody else's judgment or any of this kind of shit, right? Without having to meet some kind of a social standard or any of that kind of bullshit. I kind of thought that was cool. And of course, there was the bike, there was the roar of the machine. It was all cool. To me, as a little kid, it was, I was impressionable. You know, so that's my initial contact, and I always wanted to, to ride a bike. I always wanted a bike. I always wanted a chopper, and I've had plenty of choppers. Um, and then around, I don't know when, was it? It's the 90s, some point in the 90s, I guess. Um, Harley Davidson kind of opened up to a larger cross section of the population. And that's when you had this influx of, you know, people that previously weren't buying Harley Davidson. They just weren't, you didn't see them. They weren't riding bikes. They weren't out there riding bikes, but now they were. And part of that is because Harley made a concentrated effort to distance itself from its core audience and supporters. The real, which I guess you would call real, bikers who had supported Harley Davidson, kept Harley Davidson afloat through hard times to unreliable um, machines, you know, bikers, uh, they kept kept Harley going. And Harley was kind of trying to distance itself from that, and yet at the same time, uh, through very adroit advertising, they were able to uh, campaign, they were able to distance and separate themselves from that element 
and at the same time utilize just enough of it the fringe association with it um, you know the uh, accoutrements the leather um, the you know just the outlaw mystique to sell the bike to sell the bike you know like I say talking about a lot of things you know these fantasy footballer types and, and that's nothing wrong with that if that's what you know you're in for and that's what you're doing but people that are trying to portray something other and they're just not you know real at all that's who I'm referring to and a lot of people bought into that the dealers changed hugely like the dealerships used to be little hole-in-the-wall greasy shops and they turned into you know I mean the floors I remember floor with tiles coming up off the floor and every other thing uh, the local dealer that I would go to occasionally when I needed something and they didn't always even have it but uh, and this is way back but the dealers even became these huge you know what they are today there was a point where I think they were worse where they were and there some of them still exist I've, I've been in several of them they look like uh, boutiques and uh, they're huge and expansive and you go in there, I remember the first time I went in one, the, the girls, uh, it was kind of like going into um, the merry-go-round or something like that when I was a little kid, where the girls are just telling you how great you look in these and throwing jeans, hanging them over top of the, the little room where you're in there trying your clothes on, they're throwing things over the top. Oh, you, you look great in this, try this one for me. Oh, you look, they're pushing and pushing to sell. And initially, that's what it looked like and seemed like to me, initially. And maybe it was just, um, you know, I was jumping to that judgment just because any kind of any kind of thing like that that it seemed like they were really trying to sell me and market to me specifically uh, and impress upon me they need to buy something that any degree of that at all was otherwise had been unknown at a Harley Davidson dealer so that was a huge difference dramatic difference and it was you would, you would meet people, they started coming around places where those of us who'd been riding all along hung out. And I was still just a kid, I was in my 20s. And they would come in these places and uh, they would hang around, but uh, they were different. And like, you would find out that a lot of these people were, you know, at first you just took everything for face value because that's what you're used to. And then you learned that that's not true anymore in this circle because it's not it's not really a subculture anymore to the degree that it had been and you were accustomed to it being. Now there were people that were decked out in leather and fringes and all this other horseshit that they didn't, they weren't you. They didn't have the same struggles. They didn't have the same uh, restrictions financially. They weren't invested in the lifestyle. And I'm not saying this for better or for worse. I'm telling you it was different. It was a huge shock initially. Fast forward to today, and today it's just not even an issue. I don't even know why that term still exists because now it's just, uh, you know, at one point to me, it was almost a good thing when I was younger because I started to realize that's fine. The more of these people that are out there, even though the, the dealer has kind of seen, the manufacturer has kind of turned their back on their core audience of support, their loyal followers that bleed Harley Davidson murder oil basically. And that's okay because all these new people, more of them are out there, we mix in with them, and it's kind of more of a, I don't know, camouflage? I don't know. You know what I mean? If you get the idea. So, I didn't really mind that. And I've never minded the, the, the exhaust note of a Harley Davidson, so more of them on the road's okay with me. And... Like I said, fast forward to today, and I don't even think it's applicable anymore. I think some of the people, some of the people throwing this kind of thing around, or um, haven't been riding that long, and, and and it's like a new thing to them, or a sudden realization, or some kind of nostalgic longing for how it used to be. Maybe they weren't even around to experience how it really used to be. I don't know, but um, it used to be totally different. I can say this, and I don't know that it has anything to do with the other, but I guess it maybe it does. In some regard you know back in the day initially uh, the biker lifestyle was strong and it was really awesome uh, the camaraderie and uh, it was just a really 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 cool thing to you know and, and I I you know 
played into it fully. I mean, I, I exploited and enjoyed every moment of it. Um, I lived in the midst of a lot of it and, uh, you know, Friday night would come even during the week, but Friday night, you know, it goes without saying, you know, I'd be on that bike immediately, blast down to our local hangout and there might be 60 or 70 Harleys out front. There might only be 20, it depends on, you know, if it's a slow night or not. And just all lined up out front and, uh, you know, you could go in and you could get, I remember you could get a steak and you could get fries with gravy and a draft beer for less than $5, it was like four ninety something. So it was just awesome. And we would stay there, that was like our home little base. And we would go from there once everybody, enough people got there, got to be later, you know, everybody that was coming was coming, had been there, everybody that was coming had arrived. And we would decide, you know, where we're gonna go bar hop to basically. And the bars would sometimes be far apart because part of the motorcycling lifestyle was riding a motorcycle. So we would blast around and, you know, and then we'd end up blasting back to our kind of home base later, for better or for worse, and whatever disheveled condition we might be by then or not, depending on how that night had gone and what we had encountered. But uh, it was a whole different world. It was so cool, so cool. Uh, today, I don't see that, and uh, I'm sure it's still out there, but it's to me, it's nowhere near the same thing at all at all i mean there were backwoods places where we would all ride to way out in the middle of nowhere that were just um, these old wooden structures that were road houses that were road houses from the day and because the civilization had begun to encroach in these areas building these new homes around there or close enough that um you know they had to have signs that when you leave please you know leave softly and gently because of all the you know, because there'd be 100 bikes out there, you know, on a weekend, and um, you know, there's these people that now move to the area. This, this thing's been there all along. It's always been there. They're right next to the river making all this noise and racket, and people just having a great time laughing and hooping it up, riding their bikes and bothering nobody. But they move to that environment, and all of a sudden they're offended by that environment, and they need to change it, and they want you to, to quiet your ass down and shut the, shut the hell up, basically, so that they can enjoy... Uh, you know, their little, their little half acre or quarter acre, whatever the hell, eighth of an acre, whatever it is. Um, you know, so it's a big difference to today. But today, I don't see. It just is what it is, and you are what you are. And you know, of course, I'm older now, not in my twenties. Um, I'd like to think I certainly believe I'm a lot more mature and adult. And um, I look at the world differently in almost every regard. So while I had great times, and I look at that stuff nostalgically, and it's fond memories, uh, even the good times, even the bad times were kind of good, but, you know, there were experiences that I'm, I'm glad I, I endured and kind of got to savor, but today, it just is how it is, man, and I think that anybody on a Harley is a good thing. I think it's better than, you know, I think it's, I don't even care what kind of bike you ride, really. You know, just do you and be yourself. I very much agree with uh, the cat over at Insane Throttle with um, that gentleman's uh, perspective on it and his opinion. It's just be yourself. Be who and what you are, you know. For all the people that are throwing these things around, these allegations that are you a, are you a rub or are you a real biker? You know, most of these people, I guess if there's a real biker thing, you know, the first, the first uh, founding you know, constitution, uh, the, the, the largest brick of that that holds that foundation up on being a real biker is that you do your own thing, you know, and you don't really care to, you know, what other people label it as. You're more, you're, you're busier living and enjoying and exercising your right, you know, to be free and to pursue your happiness than you are worried about if it fits another guy's, you know, bill of quantifiers for making you real or authentic you know who, who gives a shit who gives a shit you know I'm you know do I refer to myself as a real biker no uh, do I refer to myself as a motorcycle enthusiast yeah I'm a motorcycle enthusiast I can't deny that and if you want to say that I'm a biker a real biker that that's flattering I'm not offended by that but I don't necessarily need to define myself I don't need to go out there and say, well, what are you 
you know, and I don't have an answer for that. I'm me, as simple as that. James Tiny Best. That's who I am. Um, well, also, another another cat out there with a, a channel I watch sometimes, Itchy Mochi, I believe is his name. Uh, you know, I agree with him. Same same sentiments that, uh, you know, wannabes and posers and rich urban bikers and real bikers. And if you have time to be worried about that, that's time you could be wrenching on your scooter or you could be out actually riding and enjoying some freedom and fresh air. Who's got time for his nonsense? Uh, you know, same thing in the... In, in, in the uh, your YouTube fitness world, same kind of shit, same kind of shit. Now I'll tell you one guy I do not agree with is uh, Chuck Gines over there, Back Road Biker Adventures. You know, like I've said previously, I love the cinematography of his videos and all. It's very interesting. It's cool. His rides are nice. You know, it's it's really nice to look at. But uh, that cat has got some issues, uh, and, uh, and like I, I'm not anyone to judge, but. For me, I think I would be looking more internally and wondering, why do I got to pull another man down a rung to feel better about myself? Or why is that even a worthwhile use of my energy, you know, just to engage in that kind of thing? Uh, and, you know, he made a video, I don't even see where it is now, apparently, I guess it's down, but he made a video about uh, rich urban bikers, and they're not bikers, and they can call themselves bikers, but he's never going to refer to them as a biker. He's not going to give them that respect because they didn't earn it. And uh, ironically enough, you know, how hypocritical is it that when he talks about starting his own club, he's not going to ask for permission or any of this thing to start an MC, and he's just going to, you know, put whatever rocker he wants on there. And, you know, even though these, even though uh, this protocol has been around forever, in the motorcycle world, now they call it a set. I don't even know where that started or when that started, right? You know, we never went through all this back then. We just did our thing, and you got along as ever you got along, however you carried yourself. These things sort themselves out, but uh, you know, it wasn't so many labels and names and all this other horseshit. Um, but he goes against all these well-established ways of doing things and and yet uh and wants to be recognized and respected or at least left alone and you know well, i'm allowed to do this i have god given right to okay sure okay i don't doubt that fine but then if that's your stance then aren't those other people don't they have the same god given right to enjoy their freedom and do whatever they want and if that guy that man wants to call himself a biker i don't give a shit what he calls himself he can call himself you know elvis presley as far as i'm concerned it doesn't mean he's elvis presley you know but if he's happier referring to himself as elvis presley he feels he is, then sounds delusional to me, but that's fine. You know, maybe that's not even a good example. That's kind of a, uh, you know, a backhanded example. I mean, actually, uh, what do I care if a guy refers to himself as a biker, a real biker or not? I don't give a shit. You know, uh, and the same thing with um, brand of motorcycle. I was always hardcore Harley Davidson guy, except when I first started, I rode Triumphs. Because that was just the bike I could afford at the time. That was the deal I ran into. And I had a Triumph Chopper, a really long Triumph Chopper with a Springer. And it was awesome. But, uh, and I fell in love with them. And I really didn't like Harleys at first because they seemed like they were hard to start. People were always having problems with them. It leaked oil all over the place. So did my Triumph. But uh, then when I finally got one, my first Harley Davidson was a 1948 FL. Uh, and that changed my mind about Harley Davidson. That showed me what. The best of Harley Davidson is, in my opinion, you know, a uh, whole different experience. But I still, you know, to this day, like right now, even if I had unlimited money and I could afford to be rich, urban biker or otherwise, I'm, I don't live in an urban environment. I don't know how any of this plays into defining people, but uh, I would have, if I could afford to have whatever motorcycles I wanted and I had unlimited space for these things and all this kind of crap and no kind of unlimited money because there are other priorities than having nothing but motorcycles and then you don't have nothing else I'm, I'm not that guy I'm too old for that today but uh, if that were the case there are a lot of bikes I'd like to have jack bikes included to be quite honest you know, to be honest if I, if I could have that many you know bikes there'd be all kind of bikes I'd have I'd have triumphs and I'd have BSAs and Nortons and um, Royal Enfields, and I'd have, uh, you know, of course, Harley Davidsons, plenty of Harley Davidsons, but I'd also have, um, you know, like a Honda 7, 
54 cylinder. I think those choppers are just kind of cool and they're just traditional and nostalgic. I would never have one, never owned anything with Triumphs and Harleys. But yeah, if I had unlimited money and I could have whatever motorcycles I wanted, I'm sure I would have a plenty enough other motorcycles. You know, it's just uh, that's not the case. So if I can only have one motorcycle, it's going to be, you know, preferably Harley Davidson. It's never going to be a jet bike. If I only have one motorcycle, it's not going to be, you know, because for whatever price I get that jet bike, count whatever I got put into it, sweat equity and, and dollars and cents, I can I can get a Harley of some sort. You know, I mean, I, it's not my problem. I have a, a, a nice bike now, and I'm in the process of building another bike, and I'm making a lot of changes to this bike over the winter. But I'm just saying, I don't care what kind of bike you ride. Like I've said before, I think if you're riding Japanese. Unless it's a classic jet bike, which I would walk up to and say, wow, that's cool. I think that you're missing out on something. That's all. Just think you're missing out on something. I don't look at you any less. Just think you're missing something. And you can look at me and say to me, hey, I feel you're missing something because there's something about this I find far superior to those Harley Davidsons. Whichever. And both are valid positions. Uh, it's all subjective. So anyway, that's all i got to say about that. Are you a, uh, a real biker or a rich urban biker or wannabe or a poser or... I think the wannabe and poser thing is a whole different thing, like Ichimochi was saying. I think uh, the wannabe thing is not a bad thing necessarily if it's a guy that wants to have a bike. He wants a bike. He wants to get on two wheels. I think we all were there at one point, and that's why we got on two wheels. More people coming into the biker world, that's, you know, motorcycle world, that's fine with me, you know. Um, and I think the poser thing is... I'm not really sure what that is unless I see it, I guess, but I'm sure I've seen it and haven't liked it. <laughs> yeah, but the world's not designed to suit every every like that I have or every whim, you know, that I might uh, care to indulge or hold as valid. So that's basically it. Just be you and do your thing. And who gives a shit uh, if you lift weights and work out to change the shape of your body and you, you, to you it's bodybuilding and you're a bodybuilder? You know, God bless. Keep on getting with your bad self. It's the way to go. If, if you're a power lifter or a strength athlete, you've never competed yet, and that's yet still what you are, that's fine. Go ahead and get on with your thing. And if you're a biker and, you know, you happen to be blessed that you make a decent income and you have a motor home and you trail your bike to places and all that, if you have the love and passion for that ride and you, you feel fondly enough about it to refer to yourself as a biker, I don't give a shit. You're not offending me, you know. Nobody knows what another man's history is or, or what his constitution really is unless you can walk in his shoes. You know, sure, there are people who discredit themselves and may turn out to be, you know, a shitbag or something, but you don't make that distinction just because they live on their motorcycle or they don't. You know what I mean? That's crazy. Anyway, that's it for now. You guys take care. And the weather's kind of nice. I'm going to go out and do some riding. It's chilly. The road to work yesterday was in the 40s in the morning. Now, I know that's nothing. There are people out there that are riding 40-degree weather every day, right? But uh, so I'm not saying it's something special. I'm just saying that it was bracing. It was bracing. Wide awake when I got to work, that's for sure. I enjoyed the ride. But I got a, I got a call. It. I was going to wait till Halloween. I think I won't ride after that. We'll see. I don't think so. Because I got to take the bike apart. Anyway, you guys take care. Have yourself an awesome weekend, and I will be back again, no doubt.